To call 2020 a difficult year would not only be an understatement, but just downright disrespectful. I can't think of a single person in my life who hasn't faced some form of hardship due to the events of the year. While there were some good and positive things to come out of the year, the overwhelmingly negative impact of sobering occurrences in 2020 is impossible to ignore. Let me be clear, this year sucked for all of us. Despite everything, gaming was a way to cope with a lot of what was happening in the world, whether to pass the time, reconnect with friends, or just escape to someplace better. Video games provided a way for us to just be anywhere else but here. With the year drawing to a close, I wanted to put a highlight on the games that really defined the year for me, as many content creators and journalists often do. But for me personally, with how much crap the year has dealt, I wanted to focus on the games that, through everything, made me feel happy. Not just good games, but games that made me joyful to play them. Initially, when sitting down to write the script for this video, I had two lists put together. Five games that weren't from 2020 that I played and completed for the first time this year, and five games that released in 2020 that I also played. But I was conflicted in doing this, as you can clearly tell because this video is being uploaded far past New Year celebrations, because I felt that it didn't represent an accurate scale of not only the games that brought me the most joy, but also the ones that impacted me the most. So now, this is a top 10 list composed of the 5 retro, I'm using retro really liberally in this case, and 5 games that released this year. I haven't necessarily finished playing every game that released in 2020 on this list, but the happiness I experienced from playing each of them cements themselves as a staple of my gaming experience in the past year, and as such, deserves to be celebrated in my eyes. Technically, Among Us released in 2018, so not a game from this year. I mean, if we're being honest with ourselves, probably 95% of the people who played it in 2020 had never heard of it until this year, myself included. Regardless, I'm respecting technicalities and I'm counting it as a retro pick. Like I said, retro is being used really liberally. When my friends were trying to explain the concept of the game to me in order to get me interested, all I could think was, no, we have Among Us at home. And while the basis for Among Us is relatively similar to trader style games like the aforementioned Town of Salem or Trouble in Terrorist Town, there's something about the way Among Us has you work together and perform tasks that really makes the game feel unique. Suddenly the game is no longer just about surviving until the end, but about working together and trying to get rid of the imposters trying to impede you. The difference may sound small, but it really makes a world of difference. What also sets Among Us apart is its simplicity and accessibility. I had the opportunity to play Among Us with people I had never even played video games with before. Because, I mean, not to sound like an oblivious Blizzard dev, but... Do you guys not have phones? Yeah, you guys that, all have phones, phone, right? Being able to play a cross-play version of the game that was free on a device just about everybody owns put the game into more people's hands, meaning large groups of friends could play together, and like many other entries on this list, playing with lots of friends proved to be more valuable and important than ever, especially this year. I wouldn't say Among Us was my all-time favorite game of the year, uh, but the screaming, laughing, and gutting feelings of betrayal I felt with friends are moments I can't take for granted. If you've been following my channel at all this year, first of all, thank you very much. But secondly, you're probably really surprised to see this game appear on this list at all. In my first impressions video of Clubhouse Games 51 Worldwide Classics, I held no punches in expressing my personal problems with the game, largely due to the fact that I'm just not a fan of Endy Cube or the way they choose to create games, and I feel like the direction they decided to take things made it impossible for the sequel to reach the heights of my expectations following my love for the original. But the fact of the matter is, I'm just incredibly pleased this game exists at all to begin with. Who would have thought that 14 years later, another one of Nintendo's weird little experiments would finally get a sequel? Does it have its faults? Yes. Do I think the original is better in almost every way? Yes. But I love having a collection of board and card games like Clubhouse 51 Worldwide Classics on my Switch. 
The joy of discovering new games to play, getting to take on people online for old beloved classics like President, I'm still playing lots of President, and the ability to have little game night dates with my girlfriend while having to stay socially distanced really makes Clubhouse Games stand out as a memorable title from this year, even if I do still prefer the original game on the Nintendo DS. I mean, I, just, I can't help it. I won't spend too much time on Child of Light as I enjoyed my experience playing it enough to make an entire video about it, and you can check it out here if you're curious. But as someone who is not a fan of traditional JRPG games, all I can say is just play the game. It is absolutely worth your time. Even if you don't like the genre, the game is short enough, about 15 hours, that finishing it doesn't feel like a monumental task. The world is beautifully rendered, the music is phenomenal, and the touching coming-of-age story really left an impression on me. It's the kind of game I would expect to come from an indie studio, which makes it all the more surprising when you consider that it came from a AAA studio like Ubisoft. Seriously, this is such a lovingly made game, and it's sad it's taken me this long to play it. If you haven't given Child of Light a try yet, you're doing yourself a disservice. Detroit Become Human is admittedly kind of a heavy game to be playing in a year like 2020, but sometimes you need to play a game that isn't as intensely reflex-driven. Despite this game being the fourth interactive film-type game from Quantic Dream and David Cage, this is actually the first game I've played from the studio. This isn't because I avoid narrative games like this, quite the contrary actually. I've put lots of time into similar titles like Telltale's Walking Dead, most of the Telltale catalog actually and Life is Strange. I just never owned a PlayStation 3, so I never got to play the bigger titles like Beyond Two Souls and Heavy Rain. Being a seasoned veteran of choice-based narrative video games, I thought I knew what to expect going into Detroit Become Human, but the game honestly surprised me a lot. Taking control of three different androids in distant future Detroit, the sheer number of options and consequences presented to the player that could come from little things like choosing to pick up certain objects to bigger dramatic decisions and even consequences for simply doing nothing was totally mind-blowing. I loved getting to the end of each chapter and seeing the massive maps of all the possible outcomes for each choice, which makes sense when you consider the amount of endings the game has. While the plot can be a little drawn out and at times heavy-handed, I still found myself being immersed in this world, the story, and the gorgeous graphics. There are times when the facial expressions border on Uncanny Valley, and a few performances here and there feel less than stellar. I, I gotta get some air. Also the game is 99% Gotham font, and as a graphic designer I find that really distracting at times, but that's a personal nitpick. However, some of the plot lines are actually really moving, my personal favorite being between the old officer Lieutenant Anderson and the detective Android Connor. I know it may seem weird to list such a dark and depressing game and say it gave me joy, but spoilers, in my ending all the characters survived and went on to have actually really happy endings, so it was happy for me? Regardless, if you love narrative choice driven games, Detroit Become Human is a staple of the genre that shows just how much these types of games are capable of. No, I assure you, Fall Guys is not a dead game. Yes, streamers and influencers may have moved on to other games, but that doesn't change the intrinsically fun gameplay Mediatonic has stuffed into this game. In an industry that has been inundated with shooter battle royale games for the past few years, much like the breath of fresh air known as Tetris 99, Fall Guys stands out from other 1 vs 100, or in this case, 1 vs 59 other players, style of multiplayer games by having you face off against other online players in game show-like challenges. These range from obstacle courses to teamwork games and lots of other chaos in between. While the game has given me its share of frustration, GO YOU FAT BEAN! GO! The creativity on display with Fall Guys skins, costumes, and cosmetics, and the clever approach to different competitive events keeps me coming back for more, despite the game having been out for a few months now and I definitely look forward to seeing where the game goes from here in the years to come. 
Like so many other titles in this video, Fall Guys was a game that made you feel like you were with other people, which was incredibly important this year. Plus, listen to the little bean people coos. I mean, how can that not make you happy? I know it's kind of weird to put a remaster, not even a remake, of a game on a best of the year list, especially a Need for Speed game, but Need for Speed Hot Pursuit Remastered was a chance to revisit one of my all-time favorite racing games, especially since I got to enjoy it in handheld mode on my Switch, and nothing epitomizes the feeling of nostalgic joy for me like racing at blisteringly fast speeds through Seacrest County. Hot Pursuit 2010 is, in my opinion, the best Need for Speed game. Having controls that are somewhere between simulation and all-out wild arcade driving and striking a nice balance. A large majority of the game has remained unchanged in the decade since its release, but the small tweaks here and there largely improve the overall experience, like getting to customize the colors of each car beyond the manufacturer stock colors. And speaking of the cars, I love the respect that Hot Pursuit has for each and every model of car featured in the game with specs and informational rundowns of every vehicle. The other feature of Hot Pursuit that made it memorable for me this time around is the integrated online crossplay multiplayer. The original Hot Pursuit included online play, but that was something that I never personally got to try out. Now, getting to experience the challenge of Hot Pursuits and police car chases with other human players heightens the destruction and chaos and really changes the experience of how the game is played. I would already recommend this game for any platform, but this is a must own for a Switch owner if you're looking for a great racing game, as it fills a gap in the system's library that hasn't really been filled in the past three years. It's kind of difficult for me to say anything about Animal Crossing New Horizons that hasn't already been said. While I believe having a high volume of people playing the game at the same time while cooped up, leading them to play what was supposed to be months worth of content in a matter of weeks ruins the experience, a topic for a future video. There's no denying that a game like Animal Crossing New Horizons releasing towards the start of the pandemic was a blessing in disguise. In a year where most of us had to look at the same four walls or limit our time outside, a game where you can just start over freely on a deserted island that you can craft in your own image is the perfect escape. The game itself definitely isn't perfect. I long for the days where you never knew what was going to come out of your villagers' mouths and the interactions felt much more dynamic, but you can't deny the gorgeous scenery and the allure of freedom and escape onto your own peaceful island. Couple in the fact that it gave a virtual space for me and my friends to meet and gather and just pretend that things were normal for a little while, I can't help but look back at that time spent playing New Horizons fondly, even if my village is underdeveloped and I haven't really played it since May. While a lot of games this year remain etched in my mind for the good vibes they spread during bleak times, Doom Eternal comes to the forefront of my mind for a different reason. 2020 was a year filled with hardships and frustrations galore, and sometimes you just need an outlet to vent all those frustrations. Doom Eternal gives players a feeling of empowerment and makes them feel like a total badass. The game is brutally difficult, and at first I wasn't a fan of the changes made between Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal, especially because 2016 is one of my favorite games. However, once I had time to adjust to the new enemy weakness mechanics and the combat that somehow places an even greater emphasis on momentum and movement than any previous Doom game, you can't help but feel good when you triumph over hordes of monsters pulling off moves that would impress Rambo. And that's just talking about the gameplay. This game looks and sounds incredible. I hope we're finally beyond the days of muddy brown shooters, I mean even Doom 2016 for as good as that game looked was largely just black, red, and brown. But the art direction for Doom Eternal is so detailed, rich and colorful, from the neon colored power ups to the different environments, it's hard to imagine that most FPS games from just a few years ago could ever look so dull and lifeless. I'm impressed the game looks this good on my base PS4 too, which is even more astounding when you consider that it runs at a solid 60 FPS. 
Combine this with the bombastic and combative music by Mick Gordon, and it takes the game to the next level in overloading your senses. While I am saddened by the falling out between Gordon and id Software, it's impossible to deny how unique and intrinsic to the game's identity the soundtrack really is. Mick Gordon's music, despite something you can only hear, has become a prominent face for the Doom franchise. I know heavy metal isn't for everybody, but the innovative music of Doom Eternal is so addictive, I'm still listening to it 10 months later. Please send help. In a year that often felt like hell, how can you not appreciate a game that lets you destroy hellish monsters? It's really hard for me to talk about Celeste. I mean, the game is such a hidden gem. I know nobody has ever played it, so where do I even begin, right? Okay. Jokes aside, I avoided playing Celeste for a while precisely because of all the hidden gem best game ever comments I was seeing online. For me, the hype was incredibly annoying for a game that on the surface seemed like a generic 2D platformer, but I believe in trying everything at least once, sometimes twice, and in the case of Celeste, I'm so glad I did. While I think retro pixel art aesthetics are kind of done to death in the independent game space, Celeste still stands out with gorgeous art direction that I appreciate the more I look at it. But even beyond the visuals, the core gameplay of Celeste is so satisfying that I found myself becoming addicted to it, no matter how frustrating or challenging it proved to be. Despite it kicking my butt, I was a huge fan of Super Meat Boy back in the day. Still am, in fact. And it was one of the first games that actually introduced me to independently developed games. Celeste scratches that same sort of itch with its tight controls and fast gameplay. But while Super Meat Boy is more focused on fast reflexes and thinking on the fly, Celeste isn't afraid to have the player pause and think about the best way to execute complex movements or sequences that take precise timing to pull off. Mix in a soundtrack that perfectly hits every mood, from the high tensions to slow lo-fi like lows, and you have an incredibly polished game that I thoroughly enjoyed, even while getting my butt handed to me. While I wasn't always a fan of the dialogue, which seemed to get in the way of the game more often than it actually moved it along, much of Madeline's internal struggle with her evil manifestation, anxiety, and self-doubts are really relatable and really moving at times. Needless to say, Celeste left a remarkable impression on me, and reaching the top of the mountain cements the game as one of my most satisfying and memorable gaming moments of 2020. What a surprise Elite Beat Agents turned out to be. There's just something about deep, obscure Nintendo games that are so amazing when they're not focusing on their traditional Marios or Zeldas. When they either let their internal teams get experimental or they partner with other developers to try new ideas. And I'm not just talking about things like F-Zero or Earthbound or, God forbid, even Metroid. I'm talking about stuff like Doshin the Giant, Custom Robo, Eternal Darkness, Sin and Punishment, Captain Rainbow. The series that make you look at Smash trophies or spirits and say, what the heck is that? While Elite Beat Agents and Oendon did enjoy a brief period of popularity in both the East and West during the DS era, it's a franchise that is now long forgotten. There's a reason I listed this game as one of my most wanted DS IPs I want Nintendo to revisit on the Switch. It's just that good. Its gameplay is simple enough to understand, but very hard to master as you get up to the higher difficulties. And the incredibly high caliber soundtrack makes replaying each level an utter joy and a blast. Seriously, I got so addicted to the soundtrack that a lot of the music ended up in my most listened to songs on my Spotify Rewind playlist for 2020. It really is that good. I picked this game up on a whim, and it ended up being the biggest surprise of 2020 for me. I really like rhythm games, so maybe it seems a bit biased for me to put this at number one for the year, but my liking of the game and genre goes beyond that. The main mission of the Elite Beat Agents is to help others through the power of positivity and their upbeat music. 
As such, the game abounds in endless optimism, and I can't think of a better number one pick to represent my year. If there's anything I learned in the past year, people need each other. We all need friends and family to pick us up when we're down. Life can throw a lot of crap our way, but together we're better. And as cheesy as it sounds, just like the Elite Beat Agents, I want to go forward into 2021 with the mindset of helping people. I didn't just love playing Elite Beat Agents. I needed a game like this in 2020. I can't think of a single game this year that made me happier to play it, or more hopeful to be a better person, to spread kindness, and to make the world a better place, even when it's falling apart around us. Mission complete! And with that, that's a wrap on 2020. While 2021 isn't guaranteed to be any better than last year, I feel hopeful. None of us knows what the future may hold, but I know what kind of year I want to make it. Thank you so much for watching my video. If you follow me on Twitter, you've already heard me say this, but it bears repeating. I know the past year was incredibly crazy for everyone. If at any point in time you watched any of my dumb videos, thank you. Beyond just playing games, making these videos has helped me get through this year. It has been my joy and passion to create the kinds of videos I've always wanted to see on YouTube. And to think that there are people who watched my content and maybe even enjoyed it, it means the world to me. So again, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you so, so much. Let's go forward and spread joy in 2021. Remember to stay safe, and I'll see you next time.